I am honored to introduce Stephen L. Carter to all of you. Uh, Stephen is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law, Yale, uh, of law at Yale Law School, uh, we, where he has been a member of the faculty since 1982. He has written 16 books, including The Violence of Peace, America's Wars in the Age of Obama, and Impeachment of Abraham Lincoln, a fictional account of a trial of Lincoln in the Senate for High Crimes and Misdemeanors. Uh, today he is here to talk about his new book, Invisible, the forgotten story of the black woman lawyer who took down America's most powerful mobster. Um, when Thomas Dewey, the legendary New York City prosecutor and district attorney, went after organis organized crime in the 1930s, he selected 20 young lawyers to help. All but one of them were white men. Uh, Eunice Hunton Carter, the team's only black woman, turned out to be pivotal to Dewey's eventual prosecution of underworld criminals, including Lucky Luciano. In this new book, Carter tells the life of his remarkable grandmother, the granddaughter of slaves, Eunice Carter graduated from Smith College and Fordham Law School. By the 1940s, she was one of the most famous African-American women in the country. Yet, despite, despite her achievements, she faced persistent racial bias, racial and gender bias, and her career was complicated by her brother's membership in the Communist Party. Kirkus Reviews has called the book a vivid portrait of a remarkable woman, and Walter Isaacson has called the book a riveting and moving story, one with enormous resonance for our own time. Uh, everyone, let us please welcome Stephen L. Carter. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you all for uh, coming out this evening, especially when you know, there's some competing things to watch on, uh, on television. It, it's a great pleasure to be back at Politics and Prose. I think this is uh, the 10th or 11th time uh, that I've been here. Uh, and it's always a great delight, as some of you know. Uh, I grew up not far from here, or at least lived there for a few years, and I went to Alice Deal uh, right up, uh, uh, up Nebraska Avenue. So this is also always a homecoming for me. Plus, there are friends in the audience, um, and it's always great when uh, you can have what I hope are supportive faces uh, uh, there. It's a little bit, it's interesting because this is the first uh, book tour that I've done for a nonfiction book in almost 20 years. Um, the nonfiction I've written between then and now. I haven't toured for, I just toured for novels. The other times I was here before that were all for non-fiction books. And then I've been here for six novels, I believe. I've, I've been here for as well as seven. This is the, I think this is the sixth non-fiction book I've been here for six novels. That's 12 books I've come to talk uh, politics and prose about. Um, so it's great pleasure. And, and, and it's a particular pleasure uh, because this is a book that although it was very hard to write and took a long time to do, uh, is a book that was more labor of love than anything uh, that I've written. Um, you have to understand that uh, Eunice Carter was a great and wonderful and wonderfully accomplished woman. Uh, and I'll tell you more about her accomplishments in about 30 seconds, but I want to begin by saying that to me she was uh, just my grandmother, and I knew nothing of her accomplishments when I was younger, that is when she was alive. Uh, she was just this very scary woman who would correct our grammar or correct uh, which um, uh, fork we held or how we folded our napkins and, uh, uh, and, and so on. But researching and writing her story uh, helped me to appreciate that the features of her that I found intimidating were really a kind of determination and fortitude without which she couldn't have done the things that she did. Let's go back in time just a moment. It's 1930s in New York City, and New York City is basically, as they used to say, mobbed up town. It's run uh, by the mob, and the newspapers are screaming for action, civic reformers demanding action. The district attorney, a thoroughly and utterly corrupt man, uh, named Dodge, 
puts together a grand jury that says it's going to investigate uh, uh, corruption, but investigates essentially nothing. It invites a couple of low-level mobsters. And finally, the grand jurors get so upset that this DA won't send them any serious mobsters to prosecute or to indict that they throw um, a senior assistant district attorney out of the room and they inform the judge they will not speak with or listen to anyone else from Dodge's office. So they ask the judge, is there some way that we get a special prosecutor appointed? What do you say? Is someone else to look into this? And the judge didn't know quite what to do, but, but the governor of New York took an interest in the case. Uh, and long story short, the governor uh, finally uh, told Dodge, the DA, that he had to appoint a special prosecutor for organized crime or else the governor would have the attorney general look into Dodge himself. So uh, he ended up asking four different people if they would be the special prosecutor and all of them said no. Uh, no one wanted the job in part because it was believed that the mob was impregnable and therefore the job would be a failure, and in part because they didn't want a close association with Dodge himself, who was utterly corrupt. But finally, Thomas Dewey uh, took the job. Uh, Dewey at the time had recently had a very successful stint in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, he was a young man in his mid-30s. He had just gone into a private practice, earning a huge amount of money. But he took the job in part because it fit in with his political ambitions, but he had some conditions. Uh, and the conditions were all aimed at keeping him entirely separate from the district attorney's office. He wanted his own building, his own budget that he controlled. He wanted to hire his own staff, none of whom could ever at any time have been prosecutors in the New York DA's office. Uh, and so he ended up hiring, and everything he granted was, everything he asked for was granted. He ended up hiring what were called the 20 against the underworld. That's the press called them. That's also what, uh, uh, what Dewey himself called his autobiography. And the 20 against the underworld were these young lawyers, and they were all of them fairly young, uh, who were going to break up organized crime in New York. And as you heard a moment ago, 19 of them were white males, and one was a black woman. One was a black woman. And what fascinated the newspapers was the hiring of a black woman. That was the man bites dog story. And so from New York to California, newspapers published photographs of and stories about this Eunice Carter. Who was this woman? Where did she come from? They had no idea, by the way. They just made stuff up, uh, and, and that was how they, what they said about her. Uh, but they were fascinated. There was a black woman on the team. And so they began to run these stories saying, well, there's a black woman on the team that must show that uh, Dewey's going to investigate Harlem. And there was one story about how um, how she was hired because she knew the, the inside of the Harlem pool halls and things like that. And, and then you have to understand, while Harlem was certainly the most lucrative mob territory, that uh, Eunice Carter, and I'll tell you more about her family in the Q&A if you want to talk about that, uh, was not the kind of young woman who would have been seen anywhere near a Harlem pool hall although she might well have been found in, a, uh, in say, a tea room, uh, for example. Well, in any case, so here was, here was Dewey, and he had his 20 against the underworld, and he got these offices. They were, they were guarded. They, they, the assistants had cubicles in which they couldn't see into each other's offices because he would have no uh, leaks from anybody. And all the 20 assistants were given different things to work on. And the 19 white males in the office were tasked with doing things like loan sharking, racketeering, drugs, murder. They were going to look into these things. So here is Eunice Carter, the only person in the office who is not a white male, and she's told to look into prostitution. Now, the thing you have to understand about looking into prostitution is that Dewey had made clear from the time of his appointment, he told the press over and over again, he was not going to prosecute mobsters for prostitution because, in a sense, part of it was he had political ambitions and he didn't want to be known as a vice crusader, uh, but also because, frankly, like most experts, he did not believe that the mob had a hand in the prostitution business in New York. He thought it was all basically independent contractors and entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, so to speak. So here was Eunice uh, assigned to look into prostitution, and all these letters kept coming to the office 
constant flow of letters or visits from New Yorkers who were asked to come down and tell us what you're upset about, the organized crime is doing, and they all said prostitution, so they were all sent to Eunice, and the files of the case are full of these memoranda, 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 uh, to Eunice, from Eunice, about prostitution. So in the meanwhile, all the other assistants are doing all this other stuff, they're looking into it all, and the problem is that they cannot tie Lucky Luciano, who by that time in early 36 has become the head of the, really late 35 and early 36 has become the head of the New York mob, uh, they cannot tie him to any of this other stuff. But Eunice, through a long, through basically a lot of good detective work, uh, believes that she can tie him to prostitution, that she can prove that not only does the mob actually control prostitution in New York, but the mob actually charges every single woman who works in the field uh, $10 a week uh, for production money. And given the number of women working in the field, that was something between 500000 and a million dollars a year uh, that the mob was was earning and possibly, uh, and, and possibly more. So uh, she takes the finding to Dewey, these findings to Dewey, and Dewey is very skeptical. Dewey's very skeptical. But finally, she says, okay, you can look into this. And then she's allowed to do some wiretaps. Uh, the wiretaps yield a little more information. The wiretaps suggest that maybe one of Luciano's top assistants is implicated. So finally, on February 1st, 1936, uh, Eunice is allowed to organize these raids of, uh, they're supposed to raid 80 brothels in New York. They didn't raid 40 of them. Um, Never clear why they didn't didn't raid all eighty, but they they do these raids where the police officers who do the raiding are carefully selected. None of them are from the vice squad, which is believed to be completely corrupt, and none of them know each other. They're put in pairs, and sometimes three or four of them all meeting for the first time, gathered from various boroughs, mixed up, sent to street corners with sealed orders that they don't get to open until five minutes of nine. At five minutes of nine, they're told why they're on the street corner, where they're going, and at nine o'clock they go and raid, and they arrest all of these women. Um, and they bring the women down to the Woolworth building, which is where uh, Dewey had his headquarters. And the women who worked in the field, they told they were all paying $10 a week protection money. And the protection money was basically to get out of jail. There were these people who were called uh, the fixers. And the job of the fixers was very simple. Once someone got arrested, they would arrange a release, sometimes by raising bonds, sometimes by bribing a judge, but they'd arrange a release within a day or two. But part of Eunice's idea was they also they had arrested all the fixers the night before, all the ones they could identify, the night before they did these other mass arrests, uh, and the rest of the fixers they didn't arrest went into hiding. And so the women sat there, and they were basically told um, that we're going to hold you until you turn against higher-ups. That's basically what they, what they were told. Now, you have to understand that nowadays, we all know that's what prosecutors do. The prosecutor says... I will give you a reduced sentence or maybe let you off if you'll give me information I need. At that time, that was a very controversial practice. And there were a lot of leaders of the New York Bar and of the American Bar Association who actually thought it was outrageous and morally wrong, who thought that if you committed a crime, you get the same punishment as anyone else. That's what punishment is for. The prosecutorial discretion did not extend to deciding what sentence you, you should get. Um, nevertheless, that was a strategy that, that uh, Dewey followed. Uh, following uh, Eunice's advice, and eventually enough of them turned against higher-ups that they began to be able to indict some higher-ups. And then several of the women uh, said, and most of them to Eunice, uh, that they had been in Luciano's presence when they heard him discuss prostitution with his various uh, henchmen. Uh, not that they had been there because they'd been like the girlfriends and so on of various uh, mobsters. So... They'd heard this. Now, this was crucial to the case because if they heard Luciano discussing prostitution, then that connected him with the criminal enterprise and that is had proved the existence of the criminal enterprise. Nowadays, again, that's very familiar. That's, that's Hornbook law of conspiracy. In those days, New York had no law of conspiracy. Dewey was kind of inventing all of this as he went along. So the time comes to try Luciano, and they try him for prostitution because they never could get any evidence of all the other things the 19 white males were looking into at the office. And, and, so, and so Eunice had 
Eunice had uh, done all the work, come up with the theory, done the research, interviewed the women, and, and provided the evidence. In fact, there are these enormous, the, these complicated charts that she did that are in the New York DA's archives to get ready for the trial and so on. And so naturally, since she did all of the work, when it came time to try the case, uh, Dewey picked three white men to try the case uh, uh, with him. Nevertheless, Luciano was convicted, and the conviction of Luciano basically made Eunice's career, at least for a while. Dewey, shortly thereafter, ran for New York District Attorney and won. He brought Eunice with him to the DA's office, so then Dodge, the corrupt guy, was out of the office, where she became head of what was then called the uh, Bureau of Special Sessions, which was the largest bureau in terms of the number of lawyers who worked there and also the number of prosecutions it did each year. In fact, one um, black newspaper of the era uh, was put basically on the front page that Eunice Carter is now supervising 71 white male lawyers. Uh, <laughs> Was the, it wasn't the headline, but it was the lead of a story uh, uh, about her. Um, and as she began to work in the prosecutor's office, she worked in prosecuting other organized crime figures uh, when Jimmy Hines, the most powerful politician in New York, who was head of Tammany Hall for a long time, was prosecuted. That was another case where Eunice arranged the raids, Eunice did the spade work, Eunice collected the evidence, and four white males tried the case. It was the same thing. Uh, that she had run into before. Nevertheless, she gained a certain prominence and she became very well known. Uh, she was profiled in Life magazine. Uh, she was the subject of a very long story in Liberty magazine, which no one's heard of anymore, but at the time it was the second biggest magazine uh, in, in the country. Uh, and she was, she would got honorary degrees. She went, she was in various exhibits about achievements of the Negro race and so on. She was very well known for a while. Um, so why don't we know anything about her now? Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons for that, but let me give you the main one. So she left the prosecutor's office in 1945 uh, after 10 years as a prosecutor in New York. And she expected big things, but she discovered something. She hung out a shingle, and just as it had been true before she was a prosecutor, it was true now she really couldn't get very many clients. Uh, there were people by then who would hire black lawyers, they'd be able to hire women lawyers, but a lot black woman lawyer was a stretch for a lot of people, and so she couldn't get clients unless she'd been a very successful trial lawyer. In spite of those two cases, she actually did try a lot of cases. In fact, she prosecuted a man named Jules Brulator. I don't know if anyone here knows that name, but he was kind of the king of the silent uh, movies and was one of the best known producers uh, in Hollywood. Um, and she prosecuted him in a bizarre case in which uh, he was found uh, in his house, he had two New York townhouses he bought and combined. He was found in one of the houses, and his his wife, a young actress, lived in the other townhouse. And uh, he was found shot in the head, and everyone assumed the wife did it, the young wife. Uh, but later, he said he did it himself. Um, the forensic people told Eunice that it was impossible that he could that the wound could be self inflicted because of the angle and so on. So he said, "I'll give you the gun," and he turned over a gun. And the forensic people said it's impossible this gun could have fired that bullet that gave him these wounds. But nevertheless, they couldn't get any other evidence, so they finally accepted a guilty plea to, uh, from him as opposed to someone else from a charge of, of illegal possession of, a, of a, an unregistered firearm. And there were a lot of other cases that she prosecuted, but, but once she left the prosecutor's office, things changed in her career. And this leads to something else, which was mentioned in the introduction, which is her brother. Um, so Eunice had a younger brother. Eunice grew up in Atlanta. Uh, the family left after the Atlanta riot in 1906. They moved north. She grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, she had a younger brother, four years younger, named Alpheus Hunton. Alpheus Hunton um, was a very a phenomenally well-educated man. He went to Howard University, and then he got degrees from uh, Harvard and NYU. Uh, he was a Tennyson scholar. Uh, like his sister, he was fluent in German. They had spent part of their childhood in Germany. That's another story. Um, and fluent in many other languages as well. But he was also a communist. And I don't mean he was one of these people who was falsely accused of communism. And I don't mean he was a fellow traveler. He was an actual communist, the kind of communist who did favors for the Soviet embassy from time to time. He was a Stalinist. He was, he was the real deal. Uh, he had no faith in democracy, no faith in America, and he thought that Russia was the only possible future. Uh, for the black race. Um, so Eunice and he slowly became estranged and uh, 
In the 1940s, after Eunice left the prosecutor's office, she thought that like other successful prosecutors in New York, that she would be rewarded with a judgeship. At one point she thought maybe a state judgeship, then she thought maybe a federal judgeship, and none of that ever happened, and none of that ever happened. And, and to her dying day, she believed that the judgeship and other things she thought were gonna be hers that weren't, it wasn't because of gender, she thought it wasn't because of race, which is what we might think, she thought it was because of her brother. She thought that the communist brother, given think of the era in which this is going on, uh, meant that it was impossible that she could ever aspire to any other serious office. As for her brother, um, he went to prison in 1951 for refusing to name names. Uh, Dashiell Hammett went to prison, went to prison uh, uh, along with him, and Dashiell Hammett's imprisonment, the great novelist, sparked a worldwide outcry. Alvius Hutton's imprisonment did not spark a worldwide uh, uh, outcry. Uh, but they went to prison together, and he was eventually released, and he couldn't get any work at all after that, and eventually, a few years later, uh, he left the United States and never came back. Uh, he moved to Ghana and later to Zambia um, and never returned. And when he was having his legal troubles, you might have thought he would call on his sister. She had this legal practice. She was a very experienced trial lawyer. By that time, her son was also a trial lawyer and he was doing very well. Um, but he didn't go to them for help, and I don't think that Eunice would have helped him. So bitter had, had she become toward him. And my father told me more than once that after Alpheus got out of prison in December of 1951 that they never spoke again. I don't know for sure if that's true. It looks like they corresponded a bit much later in life, but they finally died uh, just 10 days apart. They both died of cancer 10 days apart uh, in 1970 when I was in high school. Now going back to what I said before, and by that time, she was no longer this very well-known person because you know, time marches on with all celebrities. And after the 1940s, mid-1950s, she was simply a face um, uh, in the crowd. Now, I mentioned that when I was a kid, I didn't know any of this. I heard none of these stories. After she died, which was when I was in high school, uh, my father started telling me some of these stories, and I had no idea that she'd accomplished any of, of, of these things. And so, although I suspect that most people are here, if you know my work, you probably know me better as a novelist than as a writer of, of nonfiction, uh, this story has called to me for a long time. It's called to me for a long time, and a few years ago, it simply became time uh, to write it, and I couldn't have done it without a number of people, but particularly, uh, our daughter, Leah, who left lucrative employment to be the principal researcher on the book, and she, almost all the photographs in the book, with a couple of exceptions, are photographs that she found. Uh, she traveled to archives all over the place, uh, spent a lot of time working with these, these old letters, which she really came to, uh, 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 work she really actually came to, to enjoy. She interviewed people. We interviewed one person together. She did an enormous amount. She was the principal researcher. The book couldn't have been done uh, uh, done without her. And one effect of the book, I think, on me, and we, by the way, we've been hoping that Leah could be here to talk to you a little bit too, uh, but she has a four-month-old baby and it's, it can be hard, um, uh, maybe another time. But it brought, in certain ways, it brought, brought my daughter and myself closer together, but also brought us both closer to my grandmother, Eunice, and her great-grandmother, I, I really began to understand uh, the kind of person that Eunice was, and the more I understood her, the more I wanted to tell the story, because, you know, you know, we live in times when a lot of people look around and there's a feeling of frustration and sometimes even despair. People look and they worry, or is this barrier or that barrier going to close up again? And, and I think it's really important to uncover these stories of people who in harder times with greater and, and much more formal barriers were able to accomplish uh, astonishing, astonishing things. It's a reminder, I think, of the things that uh, people can accomplish. Not everybody gets the opportunity. And that's something that perhaps is the greatest curse of our society. But sometimes when people do get the opportunity, they can accomplish remarkable things. My grandmother's a remarkable woman, and it was a great pleasure working on this book and getting closer to her.
So let me stop there and take questions that you might, uh, might have. I'm told you should come to the microphone and someone is going to tell us when it's time for, oh, yeah. thank you. Someone's going to tell us when it's time for one more, uh, time for one more question. So you rushed right up to the microphone, so. Um, Mr. Carter, thank you so, um, Professor Carter, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for your words. Um, um, one thing I was wondering, um, one thing I was wondering is, um, one thing I read in the bio about you is that you clerked for Justice Marshall. Yes. Um, one thing I was wondering is, did your grandmother have a chance to meet Justice Marshall throughout her career, at any point in her career, or to get to know him? Oh, that's a that's a great question. That's actually is a story behind that, uh, which my wife, who's in the audience, they could also uh, 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 tell. Uh, so yes, they knew each other. Uh, they lived at so so my grandmother and her husband and Thurgood Marshall and his wife lived in the same apartment building in Harlem. Uh, in the 1940s and early, well, just in the late 1930s and, early, and through the 1940s, when my grandmother moved out and, and he stayed there. She moved out around 46. So they did know each other. They knew each other in the New York legal scene. They also knew each other through the National Bar Association, essentially the black uh, bar where they went to conferences, were in committees together uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so on. And the first time that I ever met uh, Justice Marshall when he was up at Yale Law School when I was a student uh, to uh, judge the moot court finals uh, was when I discovered uh, through his wife, actually, through Sissy Marshall, that they had actually known each other uh, back, uh, uh, back in the day. So yes, they did. They did know each other. Thank you for that question. Anybody else have questions? There's two microphones, if anybody does. Please, sir, go ahead. My, my dad was a lawyer in upstate New York and always used to bring the New York Times home from work with him. But my brother, the contrarian in the family, loved bringing home the New York tabloids. And they, they it's, it was a little later time than the time covered in your book, but the tabloids covered this stuff. The, yes. They knew how to write a story. They did. And uh, did you use much of the... Uh, the tabloid stuff in your research. Oh, you know of, that's that's a very important newspapers? that's a very important question because um, so my grandmother's papers uh, were lost in the 1970s. So a lot of the work of writing the biography was reconstruction. Uh, that uh, my daughter turned up letters of hers in a lot of different collections around the country and was able to get access to a lot of. Of those, but we actually used newspapers a lot because because my grandmother was so prominent. She was in newspapers a lot. She was particularly in the black papers a lot. In those times, the black papers were big, thriving uh, businesses. But she was in a lot of the mainstream papers uh, as well. And so, a lot of the when you read the book and you look at things that are in a, a nice tight chronology, this happened on October second, this happened on October fifth, and so on. A lot of that we know uh, from the. Newspapers, well, to be sure, we have a, a lot of other material, and the materials from the New York County District Attorney's archives uh, were, of course, also indispensable in writing uh, the book. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that when you were growing up, you really had no idea that Eunice had done any of these things, but I was wondering what your relationship to Alpheus was growing up, and if you knew him and any of the Communist Party activities he did. Oh, that's, it's interesting. Um, when I was growing up, I knew more about Alpheus than I knew about Eunice, even though I'd never met Alpheus in my life. Um, but I didn't know much about Alpheus. I knew that he'd been a communist, and I knew he'd been to prison. And that was about everything uh, uh, that I knew. Uh, again, later on, my father began talking about him more after they both had... Uh, uh, had had died, and one of the things I discovered that that my father, uh, my late father, uh, said uh, was that when Alpheus was in prison, this is an example of the estrangement I'm talking about. He, my father, wanted to go visit Alpheus. He was in a segregated prison in in Petersburg. There were three of them went to prison together for contempt for refusing to name names, and and the two white um, defendants went to integrated federal prisons. And the one black defendant was sent to a segregated prison, which actually the, the Petersburg uh, work camp that used to be before there was a prison there. Um, so he wanted to go visit him. 
Um, and his mother absolutely forbade him to go. And that was at a time when that would, you know, maybe, I'm not sure how those things work in families now, but his mother said, you can't, I don't want you to go. And I think, I think she didn't want him to go because she was thinking about his career. And she was thinking that the al business with the office had hurt her career. Uh, and, he, and she was thinking of his. And I want to emphasize, I, I, do I think that Eunice's career was hurt by race? Yes. Do I think it was hurt by gender? Yes. But I do think that she was right also that it was hurt by her brother. Now he should, that's, I'm not blaming him. He should pursue what he believed to be, uh, to be right. But um, from, from everything we know about that whole red-baiting era from roughly 1945 to the early 1960s, um, the notion that it had no effect is just not plausible. There had to be some effect from that. Yes, sir. There's two microphones, by the way, Zoom over here. But yes, please. Um, Professor, I was curious as to how um, your grandmother and Thomas Dewey became acquainted, and did she maintain a relationship with him after dealing with the mob? I was hoping somebody would ask that question. So, um, so my grandmother was a big Republican, and you have to invert your historical understanding a little bit. So in the 1930s and 40s, the Republican Party is the party of civil rights, and the Democratic Party is the party of the solid segregationist South. Uh, and Dewey was, for a politician of that age, from 1930s, about as strong on civil rights as a serious politician uh, uh, could be. He, we don't know exactly, because Dewey himself gave so many different accounts at different times of how he came to hire her. But it does appear that he wanted a woman on the staff. Why he hired her, it's not clear. He simply said later in his autobiography that he was basically blown away by the interview. Now, subsequently, remember Dewey ran for president three times. Once he didn't get the nomination, that was 1940, and then he got the nomination in 44 and 48 and lost badly to Roosevelt and of course was, was expected to beat uh, Truman and didn't. Uh, and, and, and didn't. Uh, and Eunice was involved in all those campaigns. Uh, she campaigned for him in, in Black Neighbor. She occasionally spoke to white audiences about him as well. And he talked about her on the stump um, because he was trying to win black votes. In 1944, uh, based largely on Eunice's influence, the Republican Party adopted the strongest civil rights plank any party in America had ever adopted. Uh, and he ran on that plank in a very serious way. And he would talk about on the stump, he would say, you know, you wanted to find prejudice. The biggest bureau in my office when I was, this by then he was governor, but when I was DA, was run by a black woman, Eunice Carter. My wife and I had her over to dinner. Has my opponent ever had a black woman over to dinner at his house? That that was the kind of thing uh, that he, uh, uh, you know, politics are. You know, that, 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 was the, that was the kind of thing that he uh, uh, that he said. So it was kind of a big deal. And, and the newspapers also, so for example, the New York Herald Tribune, uh, in, in its endorsement of Dewey in 1948, um, talked about Eunice. You can find it in the editorial as evidence that this guy is really good on 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 civil rights and and, and so on. You have to understand this is at the time when, so, so from roughly the time of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution uh, to roughly the 1930s, Black America votes. Republican all the time. Democrats begin to make inroads in the 30s and early 40s. Um, the exact data we just don't have. There's some interesting scholarly work about the fact of the data. Begin to make inroads, and the inroads are top down. That is, it's the elite, the educated classes first that start going Democratic. But this is when, you know, in the 1940s, um, uh, Langston Hughes writes his poem, Waiting on Roosevelt, which is about, is kind of, and by that time, Hughes had quit voting by then. He just uh, pox in everybody's house. But he writes this poem that many of you probably know about black people saying Roosevelt's gonna save us and Roosevelt doing nothing, which was, again, for Eunice, this was chapter and verse. Eunice had come of age in the 1906 riot where black people were slaughtered in the streets in Atlanta, a riot fomented by Democratic politicians. She's seen a friend of hers run for Congress in the 1920s uh, and basically lose a black man, Hubert Delaney, who was the brother of the Delaney sisters, for those of you who saw that uh, on Broadway or read, uh, or read the books, this is their brother. Uh, and he ran for Congress and was expected to be lost after various racist dirty tricks by the Tammany Hall machines. She had this vision 
of the Democrats as the racist party. I mean, this is, again, this is historical. Um, she didn't like Roosevelt. Um, it galled her that Roosevelt refused to allow black reporters to recover his press conferences, for example, um, despite repeated requests, including by his own wife. Um, it galled her that Roosevelt refused, not only refused to desegregate the armed forces, but um, claimed falsely that the NAACP agreed with him uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. I'm not trying to tear down Roosevelt, I'm saying this is what formed her. This is, so for her, even as a lot of black people were moving to the Democratic side, she was still stuck with these memories of the, the Democratic politician in the South, so she never got off that, that dime. She stayed a Republican for her, even, even by Kennedy, when you probably had 80%, at least 70%, say, of black people voting Democratic, she's, she, was, she stuck with the Republicans um, uh, the whole way. She never backed off um, uh, of that. Uh, but in spite of all that, um, the party never rewarded her with anything. There were all kinds of posts in the 19, late 40s and 1950s, not just judgeships, other things, where she thought for her loyalty to the party, she might get this and she might get that. And she didn't get any of that. And I don't know, I, I found no evidence that she was bitter toward the party that she supported, but she must have been. It, it's hard to believe she wasn't. I just, it's not something I could, I could show, so I don't talk about it in the book, but, but she must have been bitter. Um, about that. Oh, go ahead. I think he was here. He was here first. Oh, all right, whatever. I'm, Thanks. I'll let market forces decide. Yes. Right. Uh, well, thank you so much for this book, first of all. But uh, I was uh, reading over the prologue while I was waiting, and I noticed you mentioned that in the final season of Boardwalk Empire, a uh, composite of Eunice, who's never named, uh, makes a brief appearance, and yes. the comment threads were full of people saying, uh, there were no black woman prosecutors, right. this is PC gone mad. Uh, well, I mean, yes. obviously, uh, people in every comment section are the worst, but did you encounter that kind of incredulity at all while you were researching? Um, good question. First, as to your first point, yes. Yeah, so in the final season of Boardwalk Empire, there was this black woman prosecutor who was only in two episodes and only had about two lines. Uh, and uh, and in, in the episode, she has no name, but it turned out her name was Beatrice. And, and the writer of Boardwalk Empire later told me that that was because he did know about Eunice and this was a tribute uh, uh, to her. And it had been his hope that the series could be extended. They could do more about her, but that just didn't... Uh, 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 didn't happen. Um, the incredu I, I, I've, I've heard incredulity not so much in the researching, but in the sometimes when I've gone on, say, a radio talk show or something like that. It's not that the people have been, say, the the hosts have been disbelieving, say they don't think I made it up, but there's a there is a quality of being shocked by it all. Stunned, but I'm a little bit stunned uh, by it all. I said I knew bits and pieces of the story when I started, but I never knew the full extent of it. My father used to say that Luciano would never have been convicted but for my grandmother's work, but I didn't know the details of what it was that she had done, um, uh, for example. And so I've experienced that surprise uh, with a lot of um, uh, a lot of people. And, and, and it makes sense because I was surprised myself by a lot of what I learned. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. You must be very proud to have a grandmother so accomplished, especially in that time. Um, I was curious about two things. Uh, the first is just a little bit more about her youth and her background. Um, you mentioned that she was a granddaughter, was it, of slaves? Mm -hmm. And to accomplish that kind of career at any time for a woman is an accomplishment, but especially in that day and age. And so I was just curious about her trajectory to get to that point, what propelled her or what challenges she faced. And then secondly, I was just curious about your process. You mentioned you hadn't written a nonfiction book in 20 years, was it? No, no, I said I hadn't been here for a nonfiction book in 20 years. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I was just curious about your process since it was so personal you know, what that was like for you to sure. stay within those constraints? Or um, so. Sure. I, I'll try to be brief uh, about all this. There is, a, there is actually a chapter in the book about her genealogy, in a sense, her family back. And I don't want to go into that in too much detail, but I will tell you a little bit about it. So um, Eunice's grandfather, 
was enslaved in Fauquier County, Virginia. His name was Stanton Hunton. Uh, family legend has it that he escaped three times and was caught each time. Uh, he finally got as far as Erie, Pennsylvania, which many of you, I'm sure, are aware was a terminus of the Underground Railroad. Uh, but he was caught, arrested apparently um, in a hotel room where he was actually waiting for his, his pickup to take the boat. Um, he eventually was able to buy his freedom, and he moved to briefly to Washington, D.C., um, but you wouldn't stay long in Washington, D.C., typically as a freedman in those days, because there was a significant market uh, in people being caught without their manumission papers in Washington, being locked up in the stockade over in Georgetown, and being sold, taken back to Virginia to be sold south, as they used to uh, say these are people who have been free but didn't have their papers on them so people didn't like to stay very long although some did uh, anyway i moved to, to canada and he settled in kent county ontario in the town of chatham and kent county of course is where a lot of escaped slaves uh, ended up it's where when john brown was trying to create a slave insurrection in 1858 he went to canada he went to chatham to recruit uh and there's a family story, probably false, but it's still a family story, that, that John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, one of the things that sparked the Civil War, was drawn up at, uh, at the Hunton kitchen table. Uh, it's, I, I think that's not true, but it's a great story. Whether It's one of those that should be true, whether it's true or not. Um, his oldest son uh, was uh, William Alpheus, uh, who married a woman who was also the child of two slaves, a woman named Adelina Lawton, or Addie. William and Addie, these are Eunice's parents, uh, were considerable activists. Um, Alpheus, I'm sorry, William um, worked for the uh, YMCA, which you have to envision here not as a runner of health clubs, but as a, it's an organization with these chapters all over the world. And his job was basically to create and run what was known in those days as the colored branches of the YM. Saying he traveled all over the world, and all over the country certainly, and also all over the world. Um, he gave speeches in you know Tokyo and Korea and Switzerland. He had lunch at Buckingham Palace. All this is part of his YMCA work. Her mother, Addie, uh, was a significant activist uh, who wound up, I won't spoil everything in the book, but she wound up working for the NAACP as their only female field secretary. Well, this was her job. That were the, When the Ku Klux Klan was revived in the, in the early 1920s, um, there were a lot of black communities where activism just died out, where people were too intimidated. So she would go to these communities where the Klan was active, where people were intimidated and being murdered. This little woman by herself, this little black woman, and she would give rousing speeches to try to get people excited and active again, and that was her job. She did that job for several years. She finally quit, um, among other reasons, because there were no other women, and she wrote a letter to a friend of hers uh, saying how hard it was to um, come from the field and have no women to talk to. This was a, a very famous letter. It's actually, in, that letter is in a number of anthologies of feminist correspondence uh, and, and, and so on. It's a very powerful and tragic um, uh, letter. So this was what formed her and her brother. You have to imagine these parents who in the midst of segregation and, and the most vicious sorts of oppression believe they could travel all over the country. They both traveled all through the South at different times and do anything they wanted. So this is what formed her and... Uh, and her brother, and actually the question reminded me, uh, and I'll talk about my process, I mean, there's something about her I haven't mentioned yet, uh, which is the other thing about, uh, about Eunice was that in the 1930s, you have to, so we're talking 80 years ago, uh, she was talking about what we now call sexual harassment. Uh, this was an issue for her. She was very conscious about, interested in uh, the treatment of women in the workplace. And I, I discussed that several times in the book, but there's one particularly good speech of hers uh, where she talks about men who use their positions of authority in the workplace to exact what she calls intimate relations uh, from the women they work, women who work for them. And she says in the speech, boiling in oil is a little too good for, the, for men of that sort. That's, that's what she, so remember she's saying this in 1937. You have to imagine the fortitude and, and the confidence she had to have to talk about this uh, uh, at a time when other than the vote, most of what we think of 
as the women, agenda of the women's movement, even in the first half of the 20th century, was, was hardly spoken about in, even in polite, uh, uh, in, in polite uh, company. As the process, it was hard. Um, and it was hard in part because this is my grandmother. It was also hard because I'd never written a biography before. I'm in awe of people who write biographies every few years. I just don't imagine how they do it because you have to get so many things right. It's one thing, I've done some legal history in the past where we've got to get things right, but, but I have to, if I say she was here on October 1st and she traveled there on October 3rd, I have to be right about that, details of that sort. And, and I was actually telling uh, an interviewer the other day that I have no idea how they wrote biographies before there were computers. I just, I, I just don't know, but I'm in, I'm in awe of it. I have to say that working with my daughter um, made it a lot easier because she had such a love of the material. And so she was always collating things and providing these enormously detailed charts of the correspondence. And, and there, was a, there was a feud that um, Eunice, had, Eunice was big in the National Council of Negro Women, and then she had this feud with Mary McLeod Bethune, and, and my daughter, and, and I, which I couldn't follow, and another historian had written about it and gotten it wrong, and her, my daughter wrote what was basically an article about it with, from all the correspondence, going, this is when this happened, this is when that happened, this is when it happened. So without that stuff, I couldn't have possibly uh, uh, done uh, what I did. Are we out of questions already? You want me to ask you some questions? <laughs> Going once. Oh, okay. There's two people at once. Okay. Okay. Good evening, Professor Carter. Hello. Um, I am one of your biggest fans. I've read every one of your fiction works, and I have two copies oh, of Palace Council. Thank you. And, uh, so, in light of what you just mentioned with regards to your phenomenal grandmother and the work she did with regards to um, uh, women's rights and is speaking about sexual harassment. If we might be able to play a little bit of a game where we go into uh, uh, the zone of the impeachment of Abraham Lincoln, and would you be willing to presuppose what Miss Eunice would think about the current state of affairs with regards to the most recent? <laughs> Well, you know, I'll tell you, I, not only I thought about it, I wrote about it. The, I, you can actually find an online column that I wrote about what Eunice, big Republican, would have thought of Kavanaugh. And rather than recapitulate all 1,200 words of it here, <laughs> uh, you can find it at Bloomberg.com. It was published uh, two weeks ago. And it, it says, and so it does try, I did try to answer that question. I think you're, it, you're absolutely right to raise it because it jumps out from this material. You're right. But but because her position, I think, would have been complicated, although I think in the end she probably, I don't know, of course, would have come out in opposition, but I don't know that. But that was my guess in the column. But how I got there, going through her, what I thought her reasoning might have been, would take a while to, um, um, uh, to go through. She, I think she would have been torn, though, because she did have, she had this very strong Republican sense, but she also had this very strong sense about the treatment of women, but particularly in, in the workforce. So I, I, so I wrote a column about it, and you can find it on Bloomberg.com. I said it was about two weeks ago. In fact, I think it was exactly two weeks ago yesterday that it, uh, that it came out. If I could out. just get a quick second question. Do you plan and by the way, and thank you for the very kind things you said about my fiction. That's what keeps writers going. Oh, if only you knew the messages I'm getting right now from friends who know I'm here and they're aware of how I'm really fangirl. I'm trying very hard to interpose myself. Um, so second question, um, very quick. Are you going to be making an appearance on Long Island? My mother wants to know. Are you going to make an appearance on Long Island? Oh, um, I do not currently have a scheduled appearance on Long Island. Where on Long Island is your mother? Amityville. Amityville. But. Oh, so I don't currently have an appearance on, I, I think I've, I've only done one book signing, no, I think I've done two book signings on Long Island ever, and they were both in, um, were they in East Hampton? I think they're, I think they're East Hampton, um, at whatever that little, the little bookstore is in, in East Hampton, which is naturally run by the R.J. Julia Independent Bookstore in, in, uh, in Connecticut. I've done that twice, but it's been, Probably about six years since I since I have uh, have done that I th something around around that, but who knows what might uh, happen? In other rotations keep coming, and so we'll uh, we'll see. Behind you, you had a question. Yes, thank you. Whoops. 
Thank you for bringing the story of your amazing grandmother to us. It's really my privilege, believe me. And well, it's our privilege to hear it too. But um, I wanted, I'm, I'm really fascinated by her background. And um, as a woman of the time, let alone an African-American woman, um, and I'm interested, did she go to secondary school in Canada? And then how did she get to Smith? Um, okay. What was the connection Look, there? Okay, so good question. So she went to elementary school in Atlanta, and then she went to uh, high school uh, in Brooklyn. She went to Girls High uh, in Brooklyn. How did you get to Smith? We don't know exactly, but I do have a theory um, about that. One of her mother's friends was uh, Mary White Ovington, uh, who as some of you may know was a Smith graduate and a wealthy socialist. She was a wealthy socialist and supporter of a variety of causes, including a big support of the NAACP. They were very close, and I suspect it was through her influence that she ended up uh, going to Smith College. After she graduated, she spent a year teaching in Louisiana. Then she moved back to New York, where she married her husband, uh, a dentist, met and married a, uh, her husband, who was a dentist. Um, and what happened in the 20s, before she went to law school, um, she wrote for a while. Um, she was a writer. She wrote fiction. She wrote essays. She wrote reviews. And, and she was involved in the Harlem Renaissance. In fact, in 1924-25, she was inducted into the Harlem Writers Guild, the original Harlem Writers Guild, which was limited to, to some sources say 10 members, some say 12. But in any case, it was, you know, uh, County Cullen and, and James Weldon Johnson, these various people. And she was inducted along with Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, which led to Gwendolyn Bennett. Some of you may know Gwendolyn Bennett's work. Led Gwendolyn Bennett to write this furious letter to Harold Jackman, who was a very prominent writer of the day, and say, how did these two people get in? I didn't vote for them, she said, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And, and had she just decided to stick with the writing, I'm not going to say she would have become a famous writer. I have no idea. Maybe she, her writing would have flopped at some point. But in any case, she clearly made a decision to stop writing and go to law school. She went to Ford, and while she was in law school, she did a little bit more writing of fiction and reviews, but basically, at some point in law school, just, uh, uh, just stopped. Um, and you mentioned the point about, yes, as a black woman. Um, so at this time, most of the major law schools did not admit women, or if they did admit women, they capped the number of women. Most of them had admitted black men by then, but virtually none admitted a black woman. The urban law schools, as they were called, which was really a euphemism basically for Catholic law schools, uh, largely existed to serve groups that had trouble getting into the big law schools. So they tended to have a lot of women, they tended to have black people, they tended to have um, Jews, immigrants, uh, Catholics, uh, people who didn't fit the model of the Yales and the Harvards uh, of the day, and that was who her classmates would have been. And in fact, from her class, or those who overlapped with her, um, at Fordham you had uh, the future uh, chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals, which is the, some of you may know is the highest court uh, in New York, a number of distinguished federal judges, uh, people who founded uh, major law firms, including um, uh, William Meager, who co-founded the Skadden Arps, a firm which some of you may be familiar. These are all her contemporaries at, at Fordham. And again, all people who obviously were very successful, they, they would have been very good wherever they'd gone, but they couldn't quite thread the needle of getting into the major uh, uh, law schools. This is a tremendous service that hasn't been written about enough, I think, by historians. By the way, for those of you interested, there were also at that time, there arose a phenomenon, there's a little bit of writing about it, called the women's law schools. Have people heard about this? That, that they're basically uh, in urban areas, in the shadow of various famous law schools, like there was one near Harvard, there were law schools that were designed to educate women because they, they couldn't go to these big law schools. And Harvard, you know, was very big in trying to close down the women's law schools. They thought that this was, this was a, uh, I am not trying to criticize Harvard because I teach Yale. I honestly don't know what Yale's position was. I haven't found anything about that. But I do know that Yale was involved in trying to close down the urban law schools. So, so Harvard is involved in trying to close the women's law schools. Yale's involved in trying to close down the urban law schools, or at least make it harder for their graduates to take the bar. Okay, thank you all again very, very much.